good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I, I think we start the uh, Aishma seminar. Um, thank you for coming. Um, very much welcome uh, to professor from the Arizona State University in Phoenix, uh, no, in Arizona, uh, US, US has, uh, you, you can figure it out. Um, we have uh, two talks. One, Professor David Smith, first, and the uh, Professor Marcia McCartney, we'll call it uh, Molly McCartney, and uh, she's a uh, uh, presenting uh, later. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, David Smith briefly, because the time is very important, so uh, uh, rather than my introduction too much, <laughs> I just briefly introduce uh, Professor David Smith. Uh, as you see, the announcements. So Professor Dave Smith uh, took the PhD in 1978 and got the um, uh, about the Doctor of Science in Western Melbourne. He is uh, uh, Australian uh, with a passport, I think. Um, also, he is the uh, director of the ASU Center of Higher Resolution Electron Microscopy. It's a big institute, uh, electron microscope uh, center in Arizona. Uh, I did it once. No, a few times. It was very good. Uh, he also the uh, president of uh, Microscope Society of America, and uh, is a fellow of the American Physics Society, uh, Metal Material Science Society, and uh, Microscope Society of America, and Institute of Physics. So he's a very important uh, 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 professor um, in the physics department, physics uh, in the physics areas. Um, also, he recently received the EMSA, the Stings Physical Scientist Award. Um, but, so I think uh, he's now going to start the uh, lecture uh, exploring the resolution limit in the electron microscope. So, Dave Smith, start. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me quite fine? So I will not use the microphone, I think. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, back at Kyushu again, Kyushu University. I've been onto this campus a couple of times in the past, and every time I come it seems to change. The landscape is rapidly changing, lots of new buildings, so it's very interesting. Um, Arita Sensai says that uh, each of you will get a quiz at the end of my talk. And so you must take notes. And if you don't pass the quiz, then you'll have to stay here. And I give the same talk again tomorrow and on Sunday until you pass the quiz. OK, so can we have that light, please? OK, thank you. So today I'm going to talk about exploring resolution limits in the electron microscope. And this is a brief outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about trends in resolution, particularly reaching beyond the one angstrom barrier and this is going to introduce the topic of aberration correction we're going to have to come back and define the definitions of resolution or revisit them and the need for some standards and then i'm going to talk to you about some of the issues and problems associated with resolution limits in the microscope so let's just go back to the traditional definitions of resolution the lattice fringe resolution is defined by what is the finest detail you can see in the image, lattice image. It doesn't tell you anything about where the atoms are. It tells you you have a very stable microscope and a very stable microscope environment. Traditionally, we have what is called the interpretable resolution, sometimes called the Schertzer resolution, and it's defined by this transfer function, a crossover of that function at the optimum defocus. And these days, with the new microscopes, with the aberration corrected microscopes, we can push the resolution out to even higher um, spatial frequencies, out to finer and finer resolution, and in this case, the information limit is depending on the envelope functions, either the focal spread or the beam divergence. So this is an old, old picture, but it is an indication even at a 100 kV microscope of uh, Tonomura's way back in the late 1970s. You can see the vertical lattice fringes here, 0.62 angstroms, actually 125 kV, I beg your pardon. 125 kV field emission electron microscope 
This microscope, the point resolution, the instrumental resolution was about three angstroms. But if you get the right operating conditions, you can get very fine lattice fringes. So let us move on and start talking about getting atomic resolution. And the first atomic resolution was actually not resolving atoms. It was imaging of Ejima in Arizona in 1971. And he was looking at these block oxides. And these block oxides are lots of octahedra that share corners and share edges. And here is the image that Ejima took back when. And it turns out that these white spots are where the columns of atoms are not located. This is between the octahedra, so it's actually corresponding to the tunnels. And so in this case, the white spots represent the tunnels between the metal atom columns. So it wasn't really atomic resolution as such. But when you get into the 1980s, resolution pushed out beyond the two angstrom barrier. Mm -hmm. And here are some images published by Bursal in Nature in 1984, where here is black spots represent the positions of the tungsten atoms. In this is tungsten um, trioxide. These are the little octahedra. And these are the corresponding positions of the tungsten atoms. It's very straightforward to take an image like this and build a structural model. And even in the case of a very complicated structure, like this pentagonal bi bipyramidal defect, it's possible to start saying, OK, here is the image. And I can start to build the structural model. And in some cases, you'll see you have this little pentagon. You have the pentagon is filled in this position, and it's empty, it's empty, and it's filled. And so the unit cell of this material, very complicated unit cell, but you can identify the filled pentagons and the filled pentagons, filled pentagons, and then the corresponding empty pentagons. How are we going to do better? Historically, you could do better by going to higher voltage. Because we all knew back when that the resolution was determined by a product of the spherical aberration coefficient and the wavelength. And the only way to do better was to go to shorter wavelengths, which says we had to go to higher voltage. And so here's the Itachi 1 million volt microscope of Genetonomura, uh, published, I'm sorry, produced just before the turn of the 21st century. And here is some images, for example, of Ishinose um, using the JOL version. Um, one million volt microscope. Here is a structural model. It's silicon carbide. This is an image simulation of silicon uh, carbide. And here you have the structural image. Dark spots, lighter spots, dark spots, lighter spots, silicon carbon, silicon carbon, silicon carbon. And these are separated by just over one angstrom. So here we are resolving the individual silicon and carbon atomic columns. This is from the work of Fritz Philipp, uh, published in 1995, where it's a Stuttgart ARM 1250. Um, this is demonstrating direct transfer beyond one angstrom. For many, many generations of microscopists, the so-called holy grail, we would never get there. We would aspire to reach it but we would never quite achieve one angstrom resolution. Well, in this particular case, there is a what is called a diffractogram. The sample was amorphous germanium. And if you get the optical diffractogram, you rotate the diffractogram, and then you do some measurements, you'll see that the first zero of the transfer function is sitting right there at one angstrom. And there is even a bit more information beyond the one angstrom level. And so, Higher voltage microscopy achieved better than one angstrom. And here we are with another um, image from Tonomura's um, laboratory. Lattice fringes coming back again at one million volts. I think you would all have to agree. You can all see these vertical fringes. These vertical fringes have a spacing of 0.498 angstroms. I don't think anyone is going to argue with the ability to see these, horror, these vertical fringes separated by 0.498 angstroms. But none of you, not me, and I've looked at a lot of micrographs over the years, I cannot tell you where the gold atoms are in this sample. This is an indication that the microscope was very stable, environment was very stable, 
no magnetic um, vibrations, um, no interference coming from anywhere. So we're moving into the 21st century because people are a bit worried about what do high voltage microscopes do to a sample. You're going to cause radiation damage. These 1 million volt microscopes are very expensive. So maybe if we can overcome spherical aberration, then we can achieve better than one angstrom resolution at a lower voltage. And it turns out there are several different ways to correct aberrations. You can do it offline or indirect using software. And so one approach is to take a focal series reconstruction. Another approach, originally proposed by Gabor way back when, off-axis electron holography. And then the other alternative is to do hardware, so you have online or direct, and you can either do it with a corrector below the sample, so we call that imaging correction, or you can do it with a corrector before the sample, and we call that probe correction. So what is essential before you can do aberration correction? You can't just say, okay, I'm going to correct the aberrations. You need to have a coherent electron source. It's essential. Because if you have the regular lantern hexaboride, the crossover of the transfer function here, there's not much information beyond the first zero of the transfer function. There's not much point to trying to improve the resolution because there's not much information out there. But if you have a field emission gun, there are albeit oscillations in the transfer function, but the envelope functions tell you that there is certainly considerable information out there at higher spatial frequencies. Higher spatial frequencies means better resolution. What else is essential? You need to know the microscope parameters. And so this is from the work of Toost way back when. I think it was very important historically. If you tilt the illumination in different directions, and you record an image, and then you get the diffractogram, you get a whole tableau of diffractograms like this, and if you interpret, if you know how much you've tilted in one direction or the other direction or the other direction, and then you go backwards, you can work out what is called the phase plate, and this phase plate tells you about the residual aberrations. And so this um, scale of Toost, his gray levels here, they correspond to pi over two phase change. I'll come back to talk about the importance of pi over 2 or pi over 6 in a little while. Okay, so this is from the work of Kuhner, 1992, where he did an exit wave reconstruction. They took 32 images, they changed the focus successively, and they were able to, in this particular case, they could see oxygen atomic columns for the first time. So in this particular case, the microscope, the um, structural resolution, 2.4 angstroms, but the information limit, 1.4 angstroms, and by doing this exit wave reconstruction, they were able to see all of the oxygen atoms in projection. And if you push it to a higher voltage, and this is from the work of uh, O'Keefe and Kislyovsky, a, a pair of papers published in ultramicroscopy, here is diamond, in the uh, 110 projection, separation of the diamond dumbbells, in this particular case, the dimers, 0.89 angstroms. And here is an interesting example, a focal series reconstruction of gallium nitride. And here, if you read it off, you can see up here we have the cubic phase, the, words, uh, the hexagonal, sorry, the zinc blend phase, and down here we have the um, the Wurzite phase, so it's A, B, A, B, A, B, and here you're just going A, B, C, A, B, C, but you can read off the positions of all of the gallium and nitrogen atom columns separated in this case by 1.13 angstroms. The parallel work of uh, Hannes Lichter and colleagues and students, or Chosky 8L, uh, they were able to use electron holography to overcome the traditional resolution limits. So here is the original hologram in enlargement here. You take a Fourier transform, you get the autocorrelation function in the center, you get the sideband here, there it is shown enlarged, 004 spot showing up in this case. You then do an inverse Fourier transform on the sidebands, and you finish up coming up with the either the amplitude or the phase. And here we have little peanuts 
those little peanuts are showing the positions of the silicon atoms in the phase, and over here these little peanuts are showing, or the dumbbells are showing you the positions of the silicon atom columns in the amplitude. So this was taking advantage of a 300 kV field emission gun TEM. An unsurprising effect, sorry, a surprising effect of aberration correction for electron holography, Lichter was able to find that he got much better signal to noise once he corrected the aberrations before he started doing the holography. It was almost a contradiction, but nevertheless, for example, what he was able to do, and there's an arrow here, and if you see the um, um, color code in this particular case, counting atoms, here he is counting the phase, and over here he's counting the uh, thickness, number of gold atoms, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 10. He's able to count the number of gold atoms because he got better phase information, better signal to noise when he did the aberration correction before he uh, did the electron holography. Okay, enough of the offline or software approaches. Let's look at the hardware approaches. So CS correction in the TEM, very simple construction. In fact, there is here is your objective lens. There are two transfer lenses, quite weak lenses. There is a hexapole, two more transfer lenses, and another hexapole. And it's quite easy to build this system with two transfer lenses, hexapole, two transfer lenses, hexapole, and put it inside a regular, in this case, it's a CM200 microscope. So there is two transfer lenses just here. There's a hexapole, two transfer lenses, and a hexapole. You just add to the length of the column, and you're able to get the aberration corrected device inside uh, the microscope quite easily. And this shows where Heider and colleagues were able to resolve the gallium and arsenic, gallium and arsenic uh, dumbbells once they applied CS correction to that particular microscope. Well, traditionally they say whatever you can do in STEM, uh, in TEM, you can do in STEM, and Kravanek and colleagues were able to show CS correction in the STEM. They started off by using a VG microscope with a field emission gun. The electron gun is at the bottom of the microscope, and they have two condenser lenses, then they have octopole, octopole quadrupole, octopole, quadrupole, uh, quite complicated system compared to the simple two hexapoles, but nevertheless, you can build this correct, correct element, and they're able to put it into the column of the VG um, 50, HB501 in Cambridge, the first microscope. So you put it in, there's the gun, condenser lenses, there is the corrector, and very striking images published by Batson. I just took this from his paper in Nature, these little uh, yellow spots here are actually corresponding to gold atoms that are running around on the surface of the substrate while they look at the sample. And so this is a little raft of gold and um, early results from aberration corrected stem. Unexpected benefit for aberration corrected stem, if you use the so-called annular bright field mode, you're able to actually see, perceive low Z atomic columns. This was not anticipated way back when, when people were doing high angle annular dark field. Z contrast imaging, you've probably all heard of Z contrast imaging. It was thought that low Z elements would not be visible in these aberration corrected stems. But people said, okay, let's try and do some annular bright field. And here is a case where you have um, titanium dioxide and the oxygen atom columns are visible. You can see the structural model, oxygen atoms visible. And in this case, we have strontium titanate, and you can see the strontium and the titaniums, and you can also see the little, um, we can see the oxygen atom columns here. Very surprising, here we are looking at lithium, getting down lower in the periodic table, lithium vanadium oxide. In this particular case, uh, well, there's the experimental image, a bit of smoothing, and here's a calculation, and here's the structural model. The important thing for us here is that the atomic, sorry, the intensity of the image has much less dependence on Z, and so it's possible to get vanadium and oxygen and lithium. So you can get the vanadium, oxygen, well, vanadium, oxygen, and lithium visible all at the same time. Um, so 
lithium atom columns can now be visualized. And taking things a step further, Ishikawa and colleagues were able to push down even to hydrogen atoms, or columns of hydrogen atoms. And here is the normal bright field image, here is the dark field image, and this is the annular bright field image. Here is the, um, well, there's the structural model, so the little, or, uh, little green spots correspond to where the atoms are. This is yttrium hydride. Here is a simulation saying, okay, very faint, but now in the experimental image, you are able to see contrast, albeit not very strong. You don't expect it. Hydrogen's quite low in Z, as it were, can't go any lower. Uh, but we are able to see, in this case, hydrogen atom columns in annular bright field in this sample of yttrium uh, hydride. And so that might be of interest to some of you here, trying to do annular um, bright field to see the hydrogen atoms in some of your hydrogen storage materials. Okay, so how do we push the envelope to go to higher and higher resolution? Uh, Kravanik proposed um, he wanted to go to correct the aberrations to fifth order, so how could he get out to half an angstrom? Well, quadrupoles, octopoles, quadrupoles, octopoles, quadrupoles, and octopoles. But once you've done it once, it's very easy to start adding more octopoles and quadrupoles. And it was possible to correct aberrations out to the fifth order. And so here is Kisliowski again uh, with the team 0.5 microscope. And here is gallium nitride in the one. Uh, one oh, bar one one projection, and in this projection, the um, here in those yellow spots are the gallium atom columns separated by six three picometers, and you can see that they're well resolved. Although you do still have a problem if you're looking at the image, you could ask yourself where are the nitrogen atom columns. Structural model here, there are the gallium atom columns. The blue corresponds to the nitrogens. Nitrogens are not visible in this annular dark field image. So resolution over the years. We had the high voltage microscopes, the 4000 EX, the ARMs, the ARM 1250. They pushed just to reach to one angstrom resolution. And here is the sort of time scale. And you can see that as we started to get aberration correction, down here is the aberration correction using the offline approaches, but then you have the hardware approaches, and here the hardware approaches are starting to push the resolution. And I put a question mark there. This is from a few years ago. The question as to defining resolution becomes a very contentious issue. So how are we going to define resolution? The standard way was to take a diffractogram. The problem with a single diffractogram is you don't know what is real and what is noise. And so if you take two diffractograms and, sorry, two images, and then you move them slightly, uh, displace them sideways, and then get the diffractogram, you should see Young's fringes. So this is a so-called Young's fringes approach, where we have amorphous carbon substrate and we have gold particles that tell you the gold particles will give you the spacing and reciprocal space so you can calibrate the scale of your diffractogram. But then you have a problem. The sample needs to be really thin. There was considerable controversy about five years ago in the microscopy community because it appeared that 80 kV microscopes were too good to be true. It turned out that people were not being careful about using the Young's fringes approach. It was shown by Bartel and Thust that you have to use tilted illumination. So here they made some comparisons. Here is the Titan like you have here, just um, being assembled. Young's fringes said 0.8 angstroms. The information limit that they measured was 0.83. Here is the Young's fringes though at 80 kV, 1.1 angstrom. Information limit 1.89 angstroms. And so the Young's fringes method may give you the wrong value. So you have to be careful. It's what is called partial coherence, and you should not use the Young's fringes method with axial illumination if you want to know how good your microscope is. So what are the alternatives for you? One alternative is if you have annular dark field, you look at the Ronchigram, 
And here it's just showing the size of the, what is called by Kravanek the sweet spot. And so here is the bronchigram without aberration correction. He was only able to get out to 8 milliradians. But once he applied all of the aberration correction, he was able to increase this area where the phase is clearly very uniform out to an angle of 50 milliradians. And so the aberration corrected sweet spot has improved incredibly once the aberration correction is applied. And you can say, okay, I can believe that aberration correction is working out to about that particular scattering angle in reciprocal space. So this comes back to the question about how flat is your face? Do you want to use a pi over 4 criterion? What's the problem with a pi over 2 criterion? A pi over 2 criterion says that anything that was intense, if you had a, a, a maximum, would be zero. So how far can you go? Can you go out to pi over 4? So some optimists would use a pi over 4 criterion. The pessimists in the community say, I want pi over 6. So when you're assessing how good is your phase plate or your sweet spot, the microscopy community these days is saying, okay, if you want to use phase plates, maybe you want to go out to pi over 6. Holography community says pi over 6. Microscopy community is saying pi over 4. Pi over 2 is obviously not going to be good enough. Well, let's see if we can take another way to look at things. And so let's look at the old-fashioned Rayleigh criterion. So if we had a point source and a small aperture, then you would see a diffraction disk. This is just a famous airy disk. And so there's a Bessel function shape to that disk, and you have a zero here and a zero there. But now let's imagine we had light coming from two separate sources, and now you're going to get two airy disks that are overlapping. And the standard Rayleigh criterion says that the maximum of one um, airy disk should correspond to the minimum of the, the separate one, or the adjacent one. So this would say these two are well resolved. Can we use a similar definition to determine the resolution of our particular microscope? If we're going to be suspicious about Young's fringes, and maybe we don't have the capability to get our face plates, although these days you can get your face plate quite easily on most of the aberration corrected microscopes, O'Keefe said, why don't we look at the so-called 112N semiconductors? So for example, in the case of silicon in 110, there's a pair of atoms, there's a dumbbell pair that are separated by 1.36 angstroms. And then if you tilt the 112, then you have a pair of atoms in projection, at least in projection, separated by 0.78 angstroms. And then if you go to 114, you have two atoms that are separated by 0.45 angstroms, etc. 116.31. And so here is just an evaluation these days. This is the resolution test for all new aberration corrected microscopes. Silicon 112. Here is silicon 112. A little bit of filtering involved here. You do a low pass filter. And yes, it's a bit noisy, low pass filter. And you can say, OK, I can resolve the silicon dumbbells in 112 projection in this particular case. And what O'Keefe showed was that amongst all of the elemental and compound semiconductors, you could start off in the 110 with cadmium telluride. You could go to indium arsenide, germanium, silicon, all the way down to diamond. So, okay, 110, the spacings are well known. You could come from 1.6 down to 1.4, 1.25 down to 0.89. We saw examples from the work of O'Keefe where he was doing the focal series reconstruction. And 0.89 actually overlaps with cadmium telluride. So then you could do the 112s, and so the 112s in germanium, 0.82 angstroms, 112s in silicon, 0.78 angstroms. Put an arrow here because these days, depending on the particular microscope and whether you believe the line scans, um, people are now starting to resolve with the latest um, FEI microscopes, and now with the Grand Arm uh, 300 kV microscope, JOL is actually just able to resolve 0.45 angstroms uh, silicon dumbbells in the 114 projection. 
and there was a paper published about two weeks ago in APL, and I haven't got the image to share with you, but it was showing 0.43 angstroms separation of gallium atoms in gallium nitride. And so this is where we are these days with, do we know the sample? Yes, if we know the sample and the projection, we know how far apart the atoms are, so then we could use a sort of Rady criterion to say, yes, we can see this particular spacing in the image. But O'Keefe also pointed out one other problem, just to get a little bit more refined. If you have what is called the Rady criterion, here is the Rady criterion where you have the peak and the minimum of one diffraction disk, and here you have the peak and the minimum, and so under the Rayleigh criterion, the maximum and minima are exactly overlapping. There's a drop of intensity of 26.5%. But as you move the two peaks closer together, you are able to resolve them, as it were. You can still see a bright peak and a bright peak, but as they get closer and closer together, you could still say, well, I can see intensity there, but it turns out if you are trying to measure the separations of the atom columns, if you don't have the Rayleigh criterion obeyed and you're trying to push to what is called the Sparrow resolution, eventually what you will find is that you're getting considerable errors. So the 100 there is saying, okay, that would be the exact amount. But under this situation, 72% you are going to make a considerable error in where the atom columns are located if you push beyond the Rayleigh criterion. So in this case, push the resolution too hard, the peaks no longer correspond to the atomic column positions. Okay, so microscopes have overcome aberrations to a certain extent. Now we're going to be limited by the envelope functions. And the major envelope function that's hanging out there above our heads is chromatic effects. And so Cubius and colleagues developed a CC corrector at CIOS, and this is just showing uh, what the transfer function would look like once it's CC and CC correct, CS and CC corrected. So this is the envelope. Here is uh, one angstrom here. This should say you should be able to push way out to better than half an angstrom resolution. And in fact, once they applied the CC corrector, they were able to get at 200 kV out to 55 picometers. And so they were pushing very close to the half angstrom resolution. Okay, now we come back and start discussing some of the problems. Which is better, all other things being equal, TEM or STEM? And this is where I go around, check whether everybody's still awake, and get you to show hands. Who thinks the TEM is better? Who goes for CTEM? Who goes for STEM? Who is sitting, as I ask my undergraduate physics students, who is uncomfortably sitting on the fence and not prepared to commit themselves? That's the rest of you. Your arms don't work, I can see. Okay. It turns out that it depends, very nicely shown by Sandra Van Art uh, several years ago, which is better, all other things being equal? The answer is it all depends. So it all depends because the sample thickness matters and the phase difference between adjacent columns will depend on the thickness. And so um, there's a comparison here of stem and tem. And depending on the circumstances, TEM will sometimes give you better resolution than STEM, and other times STEM will give you better resolution than TEM. So it all depends. You were quite right to sit on the fence and not make a commitment. One of the hidden, ugly little secrets that we sweep under the carpet, that once you improve resolution, you have extreme image sensitivity. And so, very nicely shown by Chen and colleagues, they took a wedge-shaped silicon sample. It's only at this position three nanometers thick, and here it is 10 nanometers thick. Here is the experimental image. There is an image simulation, and you'd say, okay, three nanometers thick. I can certainly just resolve the silicon dumbbells. 
And here we are in a channeling contrast mode. The sample is 10 nanometers thick. Image simulation matches nicely with the experiment, given a bit of noise. Adam Collins, well, but what, how are you going to interpret? If you didn't have the image simulation, what would you make of all this extra detail? And here is actually some simulations. They put simulations inset to the three and the four and the five. Here we are going from three nanometers thick to 10 nanometers thick, and you have a serious problem with image interpretability. So just because you've got an aberration corrected microscope that says all of a sudden you've got better than one angstrom resolution doesn't mean you can put your sample in the microscope and expect to get interpretability to better than one angstrom. You better be worrying about the preparation of your sample. Okay, so I'm not trying to de-advertise the benefits of aberration correction, but I think you need to be going in with your eyes open because microscope resolution is not the only thing to worry about. For example, a silicon atom, as you go out to higher and higher scattering angles, does not scatter so much. You also have a problem that when you go out to higher and higher scattering angles, you have to take account of the fact that the atoms are vibrating. and not really in one position. Here you have the um, transfer function of the microscope, albeit in this case it's still um, with oscillations in the transfer function. You also have to worry about whether your detector is going to be adequate, so you have to go to very high magnification. And you can put all of these factors together, as Van Dyke did very nicely, and say, okay, the Rayleigh resolution is going to be affected by the electrostatic potential of the atom, the thermal vibrations, the Rayleigh criterion, width due to sort of incoherent problems, and then a width due to the detector. And so this row A, as he's calling it, the electrostatic potential of the atom, eventually will represent the ultimate limit to the resolution that we can get from the electron microscope. And here's some nice calculations again by O'Keefe saying, okay, these are the effects of thermal vibrations. Let's imagine we were able to resolve silicon in 116 and so here they are, and he's got a very small Debye-Waller factor of 0.2 angstrom squared. At room temperature, the Debye-Waller factor is 0.467 angstrom squared. And so what you see at this particular point is that you are starting, even in this projection, you would be losing out because of vibrations of your atoms. You're smearing out the positions of the atoms because the atoms are vibrating. Okay, so we have some other factors that are impacting ultimate resolution. Higher resolution demands more accurate crystal alignment. Do we have enough magnification to sample all of the higher resolution detail? The mechanical stability has to be even better. Maybe you can test that with lattice fringes. There are also issues with all of the aberration correctors that are so far being manufactured they do not maintain the aberration correction for very long. You have to go back. Just because you check it at the beginning of the morning doesn't mean it's going to be well corrected even half an hour later. Some cases, depending on the microscope, you may have to adjust the aberrations every 10 minutes or so, or every two minutes or so. And you have to worry about the impact of what we call the residual incoherent aberrations. And here are some other problems. Is your sample surface clean? Because if you're trying to get atomic resolution or subatomic resolution, sub angstrom resolution, and you've got a little bit of junk on the top and bottom surface, a little bit of contamination, a little bit of oxide, um, in a case of a semiconductor, the surface cleanliness may be a problem to your ability to extract the highest resolution from your sample. This is becoming acknowledged more recently as a major problem. Is your sample uniform in projection? Are there variations in the thickness from place to place? Or maybe there might be changes in composition. And you're also, we are presuming that we have atomic columns being aligned along the beam direction. And if you're looking at defects, that may not be the case. And overarching across all of these things to take into account 
the possibility, the likelihood, the almost inevitable beam specimen interactions. We rely on the interactions between the beam and our sample for inelastic scattering to get all the eels and, and other types of information, elastic scattering to get the high resolution images. You have to ask yourself the question always, will the atoms and the point defects, if that's what you're looking for, will they stay in place while you blast away with your intense electron beam? It's an incredibly intense beam when you start doing these aberration corrected uh, probes and you sit the probe in one little position on a little square angstrom of your sample for very long. You're going to drill a hole through most self-respecting samples very quickly. And so you have to go back and check. Has my sample changed during the observation period? There is some hope for us, as many of you will probably understand. This is from the worker Kravanek, who was able to show by going down to 60 kV, he was able to look at these so-called two-dimensional um, materials. In this case, it's, uh, it's a boron nitride sample, and there's a little bit of um, some silicon and some oxygen. I think there's, no, there's the oxygen. There's a couple of stray silicon atoms. And he was able to identify the boron, the nitrogen, the oxygen, and the silicon atoms one by one, the sample just sat there for long periods of time at 60 kV without appreciable beam damage. That's okay if you're in the market to look at two-dimensional materials like boron nitride or some of these other uh, calcogenide materials, molybdenum disulfide, for example, again. But most of, you, most of you, most of us, me in particular, I'm not interested in, well, I am interested, but I'm also interested in three-dimensional materials these materials are not going to be uh, able to withstand electron beam uh, damage unless we go to lower voltage, but then you can't make the sample thin enough. So you have to compromise. Am I going to be at 80 kV or 200 kV? Am I going to damage the sample or am I not going to damage the sample? And so I leave you there with the thoughts that the aberration corrected microscope has come a long way. We've been able to push the resolution limits of the electron microscope over the years from could we even get to four angstroms? Could we get to two angstroms? Could we break the one angstrom barrier? Aberration corrected microscopes let us do it on an almost routine basis. But there are other things out there that you need to be aware of that may affect your ability to interpret the images or even prepare the sample to get the benefits of the one angstrom resolution. But I think we're in a golden age for electron microscopy and I leave you with, um, here's a, I leave you with the acknowledgments to some colleagues who helped me. Okay, questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, images on the high resolution and uh, it's still in the uh, resolution. In the resolution. Uh, any questions? So, are there some students here? Okay, students are not allowed to leave unless they ask a question. Student, no, postdocs and assistant professors and others, they're okay, but students are not allowed to leave until they have asked a question. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that we can see the hydrogen column using the STM, but is it possible to see the segregation of hydrogen, for example, gram one using TM or STM? I think you're not going to see individual hydrogen atoms in the electron microscope. But how about segregation? And how would you see segregation unless they are well aligned? I mean, this is a quite thick sample of yttrium hydride. This is not just single atoms. It is a crystalline material, and the atoms are very nicely located and held in particular places. I mean, there is the projected crystal structure. And so the idea that you could have random hydrogen atoms in different places um, I just don't think it's going to be possible. The energy that's needed to displace them is much, much less than you're going to get with the um, electrons in the electron microscope. So even if I think if you went down to 10 kV or even lower, 
it might be impossible to consider the possible, you know, the likelihood that the hydrogen atoms will get displaced. So I'm not going to say that in my lifetime or any of your lifetimes you're going to see hydrogen atoms segregated to green boundaries in many of these interesting materials. Okay. Sorry to be a pessimist for you. I think the Tamatsuda, if this is you, uh, one of the courses, actually, is the uh, Thank you very much. How do you publish hydrogen dioxide made in the hydrogen plant earlier than the place covered by the you have published? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So, can you send me a copy of the paper? Uh, we, we have the uh, management paper. Yeah, so the vanadium hydride, yes. They, were, they, they were came out very, very close to the same time, right? Yeah. yeah. So I put that, that particular image up because it has both the comparison with the annular bright field and the bright field, and the dark field, and the simulation, and the model. Whereas in, in your particular case, um, all of that was not in one nice image. <laughs> all right. So I don't want to say that this was the first time that it was seen, but that was a, a good example. Okay. Um, any other questions? But technically, well, maybe I have one question. Technically, if the Kabeda's investigations about the how whether we can see the hydrogen or not, and you said that it is impossible. But if the hydrogen um, makes the compounds and it's very stable to the high vacuum conditions, then the hydrostructures to the atomic identity can be changed. So, um, so long as we can distinguish what without the hydrogen, with the hydrogen flow. That would be a good test. The, the problem I have is whether you can get them all aligned in along a column to give you a sufficient contrast. Because if you start calculating the contrast you expect from a single hydrogen atom, it's way down in noise. And in this particular case, with the annular bright field and the Z dependence, um, it was very, very tough and just, just possible to do. But having single hydrogen atoms being free to roam around, if they're nicely all aligned and you can look down the column, then maybe it's going to be possible. Okay? Sorry? Uh, space resolution, I mean, uh, the dimensions, the, mm -hmm. the distance mm -hmm. that we are living in the, in the, in the really special dimensions with time. So I guess there's still time resolution to see the images. For example, you showed the thermal vibration of atoms, but the thermal vibration, and the thing I'm interested in is uh, the vibration should happen depends on time. Mm -hmm. So how can we make sure that the, the distance is what well, is just changed as time change? Because when we saw the image, we should consider is that the time, uh, what's the period we are in, what's the time axis we are in for the image? Mm -hmm. So there is more work being done recently with femtosecond imaging. And you just do a pulse and then you can record the image. But the problem you have, if you get a pulse, I mean all the atoms in the column will be, if it's a femtosecond, but even if you take a, an image in a microsecond, then all the atoms are going to be vibrating. And so the, the, they're not going to be like this because they're going to be smeared out because they're vibrating so fast. And so thinking about a time resolution for, I don't know that it makes sense in a crystalline sample, all the atoms are going to be located about some average position. And so what, I don't know why you'd want to know in some point of time where they were as they vibrated. So I, I don't know if that's answering your question. For example, yeah, the 
some some somebody conceiving the diffusion of the other. Mm-hmm. So they may think about the, the type when they look at the image, but they won't see the inside two images. Mm-hmm. So what's the limit of the time resolution we can get in that case? Yeah. Okay. So some people have seen dopant atoms in semiconductors under certain circumstances and it would be possible to see the diffusion taking place and the work of Batson when he looked at the gold atoms sitting on the the gold raft he actually has done some very nice measurements and he has actually got activation energies for the movement of the gold atoms across the surface and so he studied diffusion of individual atoms the problem I have is if you're going to look at a bulk sample how do you get a contrast mechanism that will enable you to see the, in some cases that's why I'm questioning about point defects. People are very interested in point defects and maybe the point defects over time will diffuse to the grain boundary. But then you have a a, a contrast mechanism. I think if you have a perfect thin sample with just individual atoms on the surface then seeing the diffusion of those atoms would be very straightforward and, and Batson was not the first people to do it. I mean, Crew and his group did that way back in the 1970s when they first started using the um, the stem. But in a crystalline sample, it will be very difficult, particularly in the case of the, the work of Mueller and Voiles, they were looking at silicon doped with antimony. And in this case, the antimony single atom dopants were giving very high contrast. And so then it was possible from frame to frame. But in their case, they were relying on the contrast and maybe the image is a 10 second exposure. And so they then go back 10 seconds later and the atom isn't there, it's moved over there. But what is that gonna help you if you want to be doing it on the fraction of a second time scale? So I'm thinking if you want to, you could do a TEM mode the stem mode is always not going to give you very good time because it's going to be 10 seconds, 20 seconds, however long it takes to do the whole scan. If you use TEM, these days the latest advances from Gatan and other companies, you can get the so-called 2K camera and it, it takes a, an image every thousands of a second. And so if you have a contrast mechanism that enables you to see an atom in the crystal, maybe if it's a high Z atom compared to the rest, one thousandth of a second is possible. Okay? It's going to be a huge amount of data because it's, you know, these days you're talking about terabytes of data. If you have a two-hour microscope session with a, one of these cameras, it's a huge accumulation of data problem. But that's a different issue. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Uh, I have a, a simple question about the when we measure the distance between maybe the fringe of uh, atom, is there some common view that how much number if uh, we use the Armstrong as a unit? In how many numbers? I mean, for example, zero point four five Armstrong, or we can use zero point five 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 Armstrong. So, it's, it's a question of how accurately do you know the magnification. Yeah, that's right. All right, that's and fine. so if you have a sample and you take the image at high enough magnification and it's a periodic sample, then you're talking about what is the error in the measurement. So, these days there are published papers where the claim is plus or minus on the order of one picometer. So plus or minus. So they are measuring a distance. So you don't normally talk about the resolution as such, but you say, I can measure two atoms that are separated by a particular distance. And so this is a separate issue. So the resolution of the microscope may be, for example, half an angstrom which is 50 50 picometers. But you can measure the two atomic column positions with an accuracy in very, very special case of plus or minus 
one picometer. And so if you want to say the error, 0.555 angstroms plus or minus 0 0.00, so it would be 0 0.01 angstrom. So I think these days people are saying they can get down to you know, plus or minus one picometer, very special case. But I would say an average from these, most of these studies, unless they do the analysis correctly, the error bar is about plus or minus five picometers. Okay? Okay. Another question? You showed the, any um, simulation with the error with the cosalia image. Mm -hmm. So, uh, maybe I think the comments, how important the simulation is? The simulation just confirms the presence of the atom? I think in maybe 80% of microscopy you don't need to do the image simulations but in 20% if you're trying to be quantitative and particularly if you want to interpret where the atoms are at grain boundaries or at defects or whether you have some impurity atoms floating around then you better start doing the image simulations because the proof to the rest of the community is we can make up whatever we like to out of our images, but unless we prove by doing the simulations, um, then I don't think there would be an acceptance in the general community. You, know, you guys can say what you like, it's just an image, but if you start quantifying it by saying, okay, we made a structural model, we simulated the structural model, and the appearance of the structural model is identical to the experimental image, then it gives a lot more credibility at the end of the day. And so maybe it's 10% or 20%, but you know, when you're trying to show um, you know, we're exploring resolution limits, it's useful to make sure we're establishing credibility by doing the simulations at the same time. Okay? Thank you. Yes, uh, I have asked the same question now. I understood we cannot see the single hydrogen atom in the grain boundaries, but for example, if you want to do some kind of mapping and we show that, for example, hydrogen atom, so the concentration of hydrogen atoms is higher in the grain boundaries, is it possible to do this in 10 percent? Only in your dreams, I think. <laughs> for example, using some technique like this, or I don't know, EDS. I don't think, I don't know if Professor McCartney would care to comment, but I don't think in my experience that EELS is going to, and the problem you have, if you're going to try to get some signal from a hydrogen atom, the amount of electrons that have to interact with that hydrogen atom to give you a decent signal, it's going to be on its way to Timbuktu and back. I mean, it would just be blasted off into the stratosphere. So, I don't think you could get enough information from a single hydrogen atom to identify its chemical nature without... How many atoms do you have to irradiate it with? Sorry, how many electrons do you have to irradiate with? A lot. So, sorry. EELS isn't going to do it for you. I think the hydrogen is very, very difficult, although we have a lot of hydrogen. I understand. Yeah, and so it is possible to start talking about doing phonon vibrational spectroscopy using the latest generation of microscopes, but even then you're not identifying single hydrogen atoms. You're getting the vibrational, vibrational spectrum corresponding to those high group of hydrogen atoms, not from an individual hydrogen atom. There's just not enough signal there, not enough interaction with the electron beam. I think uh, all the time comes. Uh, we'd like to thank the presentations again.